Hey guys, my name is Tensor. Welcome back to the introduction to Elixir tutorial series. In today's video, we're going to start to look at the concurrency primitives and principles that exist inside of the Elixir platform or the Beam platform. In the past videos, we've already established a sufficient amount of knowledge of Elixir itself and the functional programming idioms that it enforces. And now that we've gone over those ideas, we can now move towards some of the main concepts of the Beam itself. Erlang is all about writing highly available systems. These are systems that can run forever and that are always able to meaningfully respond to a client's request. To create a highly available system, you need to really follow three main principles. The first principle is the principle of fault tolerance. This is to minimize, isolate, and recover from the effect of runtime errors. The second principle is scalability, the ability to handle a load increase by adding more hardware resources without changing or redeploying the code itself. And then finally, there is distribution, that is being able to run your system on multiple machines so that the others can take over if one machine crashes. And so if you address these challenges, your systems can constantly provide service with minimal downtime and failure. And concurrency plays a extremely important role in achieving this high availability. Now, when it comes to concurrency in the beam, the main unit of concurrency is a process. And this is the basic building block that makes it possible to build scalable, fault tolerant and distributed systems. So first, let's take a look at something that's synchronous. So I'm just going to create a synchronous function here. I'm just going to call this sync funk. And in this sync funk, all we're really doing is creating a function that takes in one argument. Then we're calling to a function called process sleep. And we're sleeping for 1000 milliseconds or one second. And then we're returning a string that has the value X inside of it, followed by the word return. And so if I go ahead and run this function with say test one inside of it, we get back test one return after a second. Let's expand this and run five different executions at the same time using enum map. So just enum map from range one to five. And then we call to our sync function and we're gonna pass in a string with the value of the range that we're running through. So it'll pass in test one, test two, test three, and so on. For this return to come back, which it comes back with this big list here, we needed to wait five seconds. And this is because all of the executions are going to happen one after one another, rather than happening all at the same time. And obviously this is not very performant, nor is it scalable. If we assume that these functions are already optimized, the only thing that we can do to try to make things faster is to run these functions concurrently. Now running them concurrently will not speed up the runtime of running a single function execution, but it will speed up the total time required to run all of the functions because it will run all of them at the same exact time. And to achieve this inside of the beam and inside of Elixir, we want to spawn a process. To spawn a process, we can call a top level function called spawn and Spawn takes in a zero arity lambda that it will run in the new process. So this is essentially a function that allows us to set up how we want this process to be executed, or essentially we're setting up the initial state of the process. So the provided lambda is executed in the new process, and then it then runs concurrent to any of the other processes that are running in the beam. And that of course includes IEX, which is in itself inside of its own process. So by spawning a function here uh, that is gonna call IO puts with our synchronous function, and then the string test one inside of it, we're running this function concurrent to the IEX terminal that we're spawning it inside of. So we're creating an entirely new process and then we're executing the function. And so as you can see here, we get back the process ID for the process that we created. And then after a second, we get back test one return. But even as that second is going on in the background, we could still continue to run code in our IEX terminal without having to worry about this function blocking anything. We can now go ahead and take our sync function and wrap it in an asynchronous wrapper by wrapping it in a spawn function. 
We're creating a asynchronous function that takes in one value. We're calling spawn. And then inside of spawn, we pass in a zero arity lambda that just calls IO puts with sync function that calls on X. And of course, if we call async fung on the string test one, we get the exact same behavior that we got up here with this execution. So it doesn't block the IX terminal. And after a second, we get back test one return. So now we can actually go back to what we were doing before where we were running from a range from one to five and then calling to our function. Except this time, rather than just directly calling to the function, we create a separate process for each function execution. So we call enum.each from range one to five. And then inside of here, for each of the values in the range, we're gonna call a sync fun on test and then the value. So it'll be test one, two, three, four, and so on. And after running this, you can see we get back the atom OK. And then after a second, we get back all of our return statements. So test one return, test two return, test three return, and so on. It's important to note that almost all of the results are printed at practically the same time, which is one second later, which is a five-fold improvement over our sequential version. There is one downside to this though, and that is the fact that the order of execution is no longer guaranteed because we are running all of this stuff concurrent to one another. All right, so say we have two processes running parallel to one another inside of our virtual machine. So process one, which is P1, and then process two, which is P2. And we wanna be able to pass data from one process to the other. How do we actually do that? Each process contains a mailbox, and this mailbox allows that process to accept messages. And so this is what's called message passing. So even though each process is completely isolated from one another, that is, they don't share data structures with one another, instead, the processes are able to communicate via messages. So if, for instance, our process one wants process two to do something, process one can then send an asynchronous message to process two. The content of the message is just an elixir term, and it can be anything you can store in a variable, of course, and sending a message amounts to storing it into the receiver's mailbox. The caller then continues with its own execution, and the receiver can pull the message in at any time and process it in some way. So the messages would come down like this. So say P1 sends a message to P2, and then at some point in the future, P2 could then send a message back to P1, telling P1 that something happened with the original message. Now the main construct to handle this stuff in Elixir is a macro called receive. And then the other construct to actually send the message is a function called send. So when we want to send a message to a process, we need the receiver's process ID, and then we can send the message to the receiver's mailbox. So inside of our IEX terminal, I could call self, and this will give us the process ID of our current process, which is the IEX terminal itself. And then I could do send to self. So I'm sending a message to the IEX terminal from the IEX terminal. And I'll just make this a message, it's just a string. And notice we just get back the message here. And what this does is it actually puts this message into our IEX terminals mailbox. And then if we want to access the message in the mailbox, we need to use a receive block. So we do receive do, and then we can say, if we have a message, take that message and call IO puts on that message. And as you can see here, we get back a printout of message because it gets executed. And so even though we received the message way back here, it stays in the actual mailbox until we go and we try to access it. Now, if there are no messages in the mailbox, receive will wait indefinitely for a new message to arrive. And the actual call will block the shell. So if I was to create this receive block again, because we don't actually have a pending message, it would then just block the terminal. The receive block also has an after clause that we can specify, and after allows us to make it so that this receive block will not continue to block the thread of execution of our actual process. So in this case, I've said receive do. If we have a message, take that message and call IO puts on it. 
and then we call after, and then after five seconds, this is all in milliseconds, you can just call IO puts, error, no message. And so, because we didn't have a message in our mailbox, we got back error, no message, and then the atom of OK. So we talked about how generally when you're pattern matching an elixir, if you can't pattern match on a given term, you get an error. The receive expression is an exception to this rule. If the message doesn't match any of the provided clauses, it just gets put back into the process mailbox. And then the next message is processed. And so receive will follow an algorithm. It'll first take the first message from the mailbox, try to match it against any of the provided patterns going from top to bottom. And then if a pattern matches, the message runs the corresponding code. If no pattern matches, it'll put the message back into the mailbox in the same position that it originally occupied, and then it will try the next message. If there are no more messages in the queue, it will wait for a new one to arrive, and then when a new message arrives, it will start from the beginning again, where it will just inspect that new message in the mailbox. If the receive block has an after clause, and no message gets matched after a given amount of time, then it will run the code in the after block. And so here's an example of us dealing with yet another message. I can send in a message which is a tuple with an atom and then a value in it, and then we can match on that. So if the message has the atom message inside of it, then we can take the value and bind it to X, and then we can just multiply it by itself. And notice that I'm setting the receive do block equal to a variable result, and so then the actual return value of receiving the message and then doing this computation will be bound to the result. The receive block is like any other Elixir expression in that it has a return statement, and it can be bound to a variable. It's important to keep in mind that the message passing mechanism is all asynchronous, and it follows a sort of fire and forget pattern. A process sends a message and then it continues to run, and it's oblivious to what happens in the receiver. Sometimes, however, the caller needs some kind of response from the receiver, and there's no specific language construct for doing this. Instead, you must pass the process ID in the message itself. So let's say we want to create a stateful server process. That is a process that holds some kind of state and this state is then able to change over time based on the messages that the process receives. So we're going to create a calculator program, and the idea here is that our calculator will start with the value 0 inside of it, and then we'll be able to send messages to either add, subtract, divide, or multiply, and a value associated with that message, and then we can take the value that's inside of the process and then use that specific computation on that value. So we want our process to start with the value of zero inside of it. And so we can create a function called start, which will call and spawn the process with a lambda, which will then call to a function which we'll create called loop. And inside of our loop function, we'll put in zero. So loop takes in the current value, which is zero to begin with. Then what we'll do is we'll say new value equals receive do, and here we'll put in the different messages that this process can receive, and then afterwards we'll call loop with this new value inside of it. So if the value changes based on the messages, we'll assign it to this new value. Now in our calculator we need some way of reading the actual state inside of the calculator itself. And so we'll create a message here that will use an atom called view. And this message will contain view and then the caller ID. So this is the process that's calling or passing the message to our process. And then we can just send back to that process a response with the current value inside of it. We'll put that current value into the new value variable so that when we loop again, the new value will not have changed. Now we need to create logic so that we can actually add, subtract, multiply, and divide values from our state if we receive the appropriate message. So for add, if we receive an add atom, we'll take the value that's in this tuple, and then we can just take our current value and add it to the value, and then that will be assigned to our new value. Then for subtract, we're just going to subtract value from the current value, then multiply, 
multiply the value from our current value, and then divide will be dividing value from our current value. Let's also create a catch-all that will just print back that we sent in an invalid message. Underscore, so it'll catch everything that isn't following the patterns that we have up here, and then it just prints out invalid message. So now we've more or less implemented all of the logic that we need on the server side of our process, but we need to create an interface that will make it easy for us to send these messages to our process. The issue here is that the other processes that could call to this process do not actually know the format of the messages that this process accepts. And so we need to create this interface of functions that we could call which will automatically format the data in that way. So first we can create a view function. This will be an interface for our process to be able to call the view message in our calculator process. So if we call this function, we pass in the server ID that we want to call it on. And then what this does is it takes our self ID, so the ID of our client, and sends it back to our calculator process in the correct format. And then we also need a receive block so that we can get the response value. Here we just send in the server ID and then we get back the value and then just return it. We can now create a bunch of fairly simple functions which will allow us to do the same for all of our computations. So for add, we just pass in the server ID and then the value, and then we call send with our server ID, and then we call add with our value. Then we can do the same thing for subtract, multiply, and divide. So then this will then allow us to simply call these functions, and then it will actually set up the messages that we need, and then it will interact with our calculator process properly. All right, so now let's go ahead and run our code. So first we need to call playground.start, and we want to take the process ID that we get back from calling this function and put it into a variable so that we can then reference it when we call to our calculator process. We can view the state inside of our calculator process by simply calling playground.view with the calculator process inside of it. You can see here that we get back zero because that's our initial state. Now we can go ahead and call some of our operations on this state. So say we want to add 20 to our state. We can then call playground.add with our calculator PID inside of it and then 20. And we get back the tuple of add and 20. And then if we want to check to see that the state has actually changed, we can go ahead and call playground.view on our calculator PID. And as you can see, we get back 20. And now we can go ahead and just use this like any other calculator. So I can call playground sub and subtract five from our 20, then call playground.mult, and then we can multiply this by 10. And then if we call view, you can see here we get back 150. Then we can divide it by two, and then call view, and we get back a 75.0 float value. Now, of course, the advantage of abstracting our calculator out like this is that the fact that we can make as many calculator processes as we want. So as you can see here, I call enum.map on 1 to 100, and then I can call playground.start every single time we iterate through this range, and we'll get back a list of 100 different process IDs. And all of these will have their own state, and we can then call them like we did with our calculator. Each of the processes roughly takes up about two kilobytes in memory, so they're not very big. And because they're just waiting for messages, they do not take up any kind of CPU time. And so spawning 100 processes like this is not actually eating up our memory at all. Anyway guys, I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. If you did, feel free to like and subscribe. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them in the comment box below. And if you dislike the video, then by all means, downvote it as much as you like. If you want to catch the next video in this series, feel free to click that little bell and then that will notify you when I put out a new video. Alright guys, well have a good night.